four seconds of two logos. This opening credit helicopter has no idea where it wants to go. Beauty pageants. I had no idea her breasts were so... Ha ha, Freddie Prince Jr., but that sexist comment is about your future wife and the mother of your children. Your chum bait. Take a hike. Do I send the cliche asshole or chum bait? Let's beam down to Dawson's Beach. Ha <laughs> ha, movie's writer makes a reference to his own show. She hears this, like, scratching sound. It's in the roof a scratching the sound. It's a drip. Why are you even telling this story if everyone's heard it already? No, no, car. he's been decapitated and it's the blood. I realize this correcting the story shit is probably some kind of misguided commentary on the ever-evolving nature of urban legends, but for the movie, it's just f***ing noise, man. No, he wasn't decapitated. He was gutted with a hook. So literally all four of you have heard the story enough times to be sure your version is correct? Now that's the original story. That's the way it really happened. Also, a movie that famously deviated way, way far from its source material has a character who believes in telling the story correctly. Ryan Phillippe and Sarah Michelle Gellar are sexually involved, but are not also step-siblings in this movie. Are you sure? This relationship is defined jacket removal as the universal sign for being ready for sex. Camera pans away from what we actually want to see to give us the view of the dirty-ass ocean. Or what the hell is this crap? They gave Ryan Phillippe a script that said, whatever your line is, just be a dick about it. These are some useless ass flashlights here, since the entire scene is shot with extraordinary lighting. I think he's dead. Well then, let's definitely build the entire movie upon this one half ass statement then. Who is he? Can't tell. His face is all messed up. But you'd definitely be able to figure out who this random person was if his face wasn't messed up. The guy's dead. You're not a doctor! You don't make that decision! Pretty much any of you could make that decision by, oh, I don't know, checking for a pulse? Think about what? He was crossing the road in the middle of the night, okay? It was an accident. You weren't drinking or speeding. This girl makes so much sense, I'm surprised this movie allowed her to say that line of dialogue. Movie expects us to believe that the guy in the truck can't see Ray and Barry moving a f***ing body. Who is it? It's Max. First off, Helen seems to believe that everyone else in this movie knows who everyone else is by pure sight. Second off, one person ends up driving by on this lonely road and it just happens to be the guy who's in unrequited love with Julie. What can I do for you, Max? You can wipe that my sh don't stink grin off your face. Of all the people for him to have class warfare with, he picks the really poor kid, who is mostly just as downtrodden as he is. These kids, convinced they committed manslaughter, who have carried the body to a secret water dock thing, have still not checked the dude's pulse. Just shut up! Christ already, I'll do it! Because I have something integral to the plot on my head right now. Guy who was just fighting back fine decides to descend into the water completely still, his hand extended up, showing off the evidence he grabbed of his killer's identities, like he's the lady of the f***ing lake. Movie now expects us to believe that Barry can see perfectly in this water when it's dark outside, and there's some mega beam of light able to penetrate the surface to light it up like we're in Finding Nemo or some shit. Movie wastes the killer won't die scene in the first 25 minutes of the movie, but it sure ain't done. Don't you noise your head, you f***ing say it! Drool anger. We take this to our grave! Let me hear it! Both Julie's boyfriend and best friend allow this to happen. I think I just lost my girlfriend over a murder face. Julie. You're going home for the summer. Good thing Julie's reluctant to go, or else we never could have heard this clunky exposition. Remember, sun and fun. Is it racist that she's gonna dump this black girlfriend for Brandy in, like, a year? I think it's racist. I help my friend stash a dead body eating. Well then what is wrong? I mean, you look like death. Which, despite you having killed someone a year ago, I only just now noticed. That's mail. The letter came today. I was kind of weirded out it didn't have a stamp or return address on it, but it's probably just like any other letter, really. Your father must be turning over in his grave. To tell that guy you killed, man, she's really not that bad when she's not hiding murdered people in the water. Roll credits. Who sent this? There's no postmark or return address. Julie believes two things that are unbelievable. One, that her mom would in any way know who delivered this letter. Like the person who sent this would show his or her face. And two, that her mom won't in any way be curious as to the contents of the letter. You can keep looking at it, but it's only seven words. Long for the title of a movie, sure, but short for a letter. Freaky Strong Wind indicates something ominous from exactly one year ago is about to resurface cliche. Helen doesn't have a New York number. If you need to speak with her, I suggest you go to Women's Fragrances, 10 feet to your left. It's almost like this scene was created so that the movie could cast suspicions on the hot girl from Billy Madison. And I don't care. That girl from Billy Madison did not do this, because she's way too pretty for this. Julie, we were so careful. Were we? You were not. What are you two doing here? To let your renowned sense of humor cheer us up. This is nothing. I know what you did last summer. Ooh. What a crock of sh**. You're right. I'm sure all the other residents of this sleepy fishing village also got the same note. It's just a prank. Except, you did kill a dude last summer, so maybe there's that. Barry leaves Max without even once addressing the letter or anything, because that's what dickheads do, is care so much about something to threaten your life over it, but not actually address what it is. <laughs> Max grabs the hook Barry threatened him with, because if it's one thing this movie needs, it's to make everyone a suspect. It's not like he wasn't already the most obvious. Don't you test me, mother I'll call the cops on your college quarterback ass! Ooh, exposition via angry nerd shouting. That's every bit as original as it is stupid as hell. I'll be damned. I'll be damned too! 
Imagine this guy just showing up out of nowhere at this very moment. So Ray grew up to be a fisherman, huh? That's racist. I gotta get back to work. You managed to find Barry, drive to this dock, wait for him to beat up Max, and still somehow haven't used up your lunch hour? All right, I'll just angrily slam this here in case people haven't gotten the point yet. Killer kills Max because after all, he's definitely not innocent in this caper. He drove through the crime scene without knowing there was a dead body or being involved with his death, so f that guy. Also, was this the plan? Come out to Max's work, take a hook, and use that as your primary murder weapon? And kill him first, by all means, because reasons? And send Julie a letter but no one else because she's special and everyone else is not? Hello? What the f*** do you care? You're in a public gym, and you're an asshole with no friends, so what's this hello shit anyway? And didn't Kevin Williamson make fun of this very thing in Scream? Killer always looks for the light that can cause scary shadows. Classic horror movie bullshit here. He walks the entirety of the locker room, which is all three rows, and yet somehow doesn't hear his locker being open ten feet away. Barry is the starting quarterback of the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things football team. There's simply no place to avoid a car anywhere. Killer believes he will survive this way of trying to murder people. Also, Barry survived this. <laughs> Please don't! Movie fades to black because the killer doesn't kill Barry here. Even the movie has a hard time figuring out the point. That's right, the killer left him alive. Because the proper way to exact revenge on people is to f with them for no reason, for an inordinate amount of time. Duh! If he wanted me dead, he could have done it. He's just f***ing with us. Who is? Helen, we're going to have to remove your character soon for asking this damn question too many times. Besides, what did he say at the very beginning of the scene? No, for the 40th f***ing time, I couldn't see his face. Some guy in a slicker! Well, that narrows it down. This being a quaint little fishing village and all. Dude, who says he's trying to narrow it down? Helen asked him a question and he doesn't know a lot of details. So it's not like he expects anyone to know who it is based on what little he knows. Who's ever doing this isn't going to the police. We could find this guy, talk to him. Wait a minute. The whole reason you'd think you can do this is because the guy could have killed Barry but chose not to. But did everybody forget when he smashed him through a shack with his car a minute ago? Was that not an attempt on his life? Did the killer even know he'd survive that? This article about the Marlins is about the Houston Comets WNBA team. This article about the Marlins is about Steve Spurrier being a dick to Tennessee football. Also, you live in the time of dial-up modems and brick laptops, but sure. Instant connection to library database. Ah, pre-lesbian Anne Hesh. <laughs> of course David Egan's sister has a rain slicker hung up prominently in the living room because everybody did it. <sighs> Missy stands around like none of this is suspicious at all. It's a series of Anne Hesh non-reaction shots. In the editing room, they look for whatever look meant the least. We were sweet on each other for about two minutes. These people are total strangers, but I guess I can go ahead, open up, and tell them about this friend David and some semi-private details they didn't ask for. Hey! Because this is something people do. Run like a madman to a car because someone forgot their cigarettes. And by the way, we've never seen any of these characters smoke the entire movie. Damn, I'm just thinking it started right up. <laughs> Funny how that happens. Well, see ya. I won't bother to let you stand back from my car as I drive off. Killer's been waiting for Helen all day, and luckily she doesn't lock the door. And has an alcoholic father who's wrapped up in college baseball. Killer makes a casual stroll up the stairs, confident that Helen won't see him in time. The nothing happens jump scare. I am not in this closet right now. Yeah! Because that's what sisters do. Just walk into the other sister's room without saying a damn word and putting a hand on the shoulder because they apparently know they're in a horror movie. What the f*** is up with this killer? He is crazy patient to basically tell people what they already know. He knows what they did last summer. And the killing should have begun long ago, especially since he decided to kill Max out of nowhere. Hell, what was the point of taking the hook out earlier if the whole plan was to just send a message? Also, this asshole was able to walk out of the closet, cut her hair, put a crown on her head, write a message on her mirror, and walk back down the stairs and out of the house without making one bit of noise. Not soon enough for me. When did this motherfucker have time to do this sh you can't spend all night plotting a bad haircut in Helen's room and then decide, you know what, I'm gonna put a dead body in Julie's trunk and cover it with crabs. Without making a single noise! It appears that Julie and Helen got in their sexiest outfits to go investigate and- Oh, f*** you. This dude would have had to follow Julie to this point, clean out the trunk with the dead body and hundreds of crabs in broad daylight, put the body and crabs in his car and drive off with nobody seeing him. I believe you, Julie. Yeah, but why? This is exactly what he wants. We can't go to the police, not now he's- Kitty! What are you waiting for, huh? What are you waiting for? Character does exactly what I did in the theater when I watched this movie. Also, what is he waiting for? Movie runtime? I love how he's so angry he waited a year for some reason, and then just wants to jackass these kids instead of kill them. Barry decides, out of the f***ing blue, to think Ray is behind this, with no evidence beyond his own frustrated forensic impotence. Then let's get the hell out of here. We can leave town. Disappear. I've already disappeared. But then you came back home, allowing the killer to find and taunt you. You offer no evidence that disappearing is not an awesome plan, because it is. We were told the previous night that the parade was the next day, and that she couldn't go to work at 10am because of it. So how did she get manageable hair in time for the parade? Remember how Ray was being sarcastic about everyone in town wearing a rain slicker, and how it would be hard to find the killer with that kind of description? Yeah, well, these guys don't give a shit. Rain slicker? You're f***ing guilty. Where the hell is he? I don't know. Better tackle all the people with rain slickers and find out. Just because a person is weird does not mean they are a walking jump scare factory. So many people to tackle, so little time. Oh, sh**. I just realized the killer is a fisherman and I live in Fisherman Central. Shit. 
I don't think Barry can tackle that high. He left a note. I had to keep this hidden from the insurance company because they wouldn't pay me the money, you know, if it was suicide. I still have it because suicide notes are wonderful keepsakes. This town's pageant forces the previous year's winner to sit on stage for every single act because if there's anything this town loves more than fish, it's awkwardness. Plus, we didn't see the previous queen at all in the beginning of the movie. Excuse me, coming through. Don't mind me. Oh, there, little lady. You're screaming for obviously no reason whatsoever. We'll have to restrain you because of what I conclude to be your period. Hey! What's the problem? Well, if anyone would simply look upward toward the balcony, this would be an easy mystery to solve. This is really not my idea of a funny joke. I guess all blood was wiped from the scene in the amount of time everyone restrained Helen because she's a woman. No. He was here. Helen plays the pronoun game so that the already angry cop will have to ask who he is. I'm gonna take you home. Parents are really worried about you. Your father's only drinking a fifth of what he usually does, and he's switched from college baseball to curling. Absolutely nobody is around on July 4th because the killer wants it that way. Oh, we're gonna have to take the alley. Because there's a yellow thing in the small town road that I, as one of the few cops here, know nothing about. Plus, the alley is where death happens. There's been a murder, and you're gonna fry in hell if you ignore it. Didn't you participate in a murder last year? What kind of frying do you expect to be doing? Dickhead Killer knew that not only would this dip cop be driving her home, but that he'd also drive right through this alley because he'd easily fall for the fake town road closure cops would totally know about charade. That's him behind you! Actually, he's right in front of him, dumbass. Now you're responsible for killing another person. Yeah, you don't want to kill people with a bloody hook. You don't want people thinking you're an unsanitary killer. She's been running and he's been walking this whole time. She either runs really slow or he walks really fast. Also, Buffy is somehow able to run all over town without anyone but the killer seeing her or anybody even being outside. Elsa! Elsa! Movie unintentionally inspires Elsa-based sister issues from Frozen. Killer is certain that he will reach Helen before her sister opens the door to the store, so he keeps walking. Because if this doesn't work, he'll surely be inside the store somehow in the next scene. Elsa might be one of the most infuriating characters in horror movie history, which says a lot. She hates her sister so much that genuine pleas for help outside don't even get her to do the right thing. Also, if you're Helen, at what point do you finally say, F*** it, I need to run. Lock the other door, I'll call the police. What is going on? Just Man, I feel really sorry for Bridget Wilson. Like, I feel like I have to apologize for this movie, and I didn't have anything to do with it. That's how bad this character is. And yep, Killer knows that the other entrance was open and managed to make it inside before it got locked. Because that's what stores do on July 4th, is just have back entrances open well into the night. Girl calling 911 heard a scream, so naturally she hangs up on 911. How the hell did this asshole dispose of Elsa and get underneath one of these plastic covers so fast? This guy walks when he kills people, but he's like the Flash when it comes to setting shit up that doesn't make any sense. This is why most horror villains choose not to use the cover yourself in plastic first method of attacking victims. So the platform got away. Boo hoo. Just cut the freaking pull cord she's using, you idiot. They are clearly shown in this shot to extend all the way down to where you're standing. Man, that is maybe one of the most convenient piles of trash ever. How have the fireworks not gone off already? It's been dark for hours. What the f***? What do you care? Get into public view already. How in f**k's sake did he not only get here ahead of her to hide and pop out, but also know exactly which route she was going to take? Look, I know you wanted a shot with both marching band people and the killer in it, so we'd see how close she got before dying, but these f**kers are marching on the damn sidewalk and no parade in any small town I've ever been to does that shit. Because usually, usually, there are spectators watching the parade, standing on the sidewalk. Jesus. Also, I just realized, didn't they do a parade in the daytime for the pageant? And now a nighttime parade? In a tiny fishing village? This town fing loves parades. Wait a second. You, you think this Willis guy killed David, then we killed him? I know, it's a bunch of bullshit. The guy knew David Egan was going to mourn his girlfriend's death and showed up to the exact spot to kill him. And it gives you guys a morally justified pass for killing Willis because he was an evil hook killer the whole time. On the boat! Inside! Hurry! Which boat? This is a freaking boatyard. Raise one of the guys you're trying to revenge murder and you just knock him out? She's already running to your boat. Stab him really quick. Come on, man, you really suck at revenge. This picture was taken a few hours ago. He then got a super large print made at the one hour photo lab and came back here to tape it up on the wall, even though he's been pretty busy killing Barry and Buffy and all. Kids like you should be out having fun, drinking. Party. This guy decides for no reason that he's going to pretend to be a good guy before he kills Julie. He could just kill her now, but he knows the drama can't be built that way. Jump in the water! Just stomp on her fingers! Julie! Yeah, probably the perfect time to call out for Julie now while you have an unkillable killer on the ropes. Don't bother disarming that dude before you call out to your ex-girlfriend. Damn it, man, did you forget that you're in a battle with a hook killer? Also, again, the killer merely incapacitates Ray instead of killing him easily. It's kind of like he forgot Ray is one of the four people he's intent on revenge murdering. Killer decides, I could kill him with my hook, but I'll let the ocean decide this. Yeah, okay. So, how did he drag Helen's body all the way to his boat from the alley where he killed her without anyone seeing it? So many things in this movie depend on the whole town being unobservant. Isn't it, like, mega convenient that this heavy hook on a rope is the perfect distance from the fulcrum above to be grabbable by Ray, but also face-smashing distance for the killer who is 20 feet below Ray? 
Wait, did I say convenient? I meant impossible. That's not how pendulums work, you dicks. My daughter got wrongfully killed power. Just hook him in the stomach. When you leave a man for dead, make sure he's really dead. Coincide irony. Just irony. Well, glad that's over. There's no way he could survive drowning a second time on the anniversary of the first time he drowned. We never killed anyone, sir. This whole year was for... I know. The guilt was killing me. And because that man wasn't dead and was actually a killer, I feel no guilt whatsoever because of that extremely lucky circumstance. I love you, Julie. No one gets me the way you do. Knowing what I know of both your characters, which is nothing, I think that's a true statement. I understand your pain. This line. <laughs> Bullsh** party invitation has the exact same handwriting as the psycho killer who sent her a note last year. Roll crit- Oh, f We'll have to wait around another year for that bullshit. Can't hardly wait. Oh well, I guess it's a dream. No sequel, she dies. Sequel, dream. So that's how that works. There must have been a dog or something. His name was David Egan. In Project Mayhem, we have no names. No, you listen to me. This is a man, and he has a name. And it's Robert Paulson. My jacket. I love this jacket. You and my kid brother, you would have killed for this jacket. Silk lining, fine Corinthian leather. I got a bad taste in my mouth out here. Aluminum. Ash. I can smell a psychosphere. I got an idea. Let's make the car a place of silent reflection from now on. Okay? I'll give you something you've been obsessing about ever since our parents got married. Be more specific. In English? I'll f your brains out. No way. You can put it anywhere. <laughs>